Professor Donald Lopez Jr., welcome to the Bookshelf Conversations. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have my book on, on the baseball bookshelf. Now, as I said when we were chatting before, this is probably one of the more intimidating discussions, conversations I've had given the topic of the book, which is Buddha Takes the Mound, Enlightenment in Nine Innings. So you are a uh, Buddhist scholar. This is your forte. You're also a hardcore baseball fan. Uh, so chicken egg, which, which came first here? Is this a, a baseball book for Buddhists or a book about Buddhism for baseball fans? It's really intended to be both. Uh, you know, I've been a fan, uh, a base Yankees fan for as long as I can remember. As I say in the book, my first memory is Mazarowski's uh, improbable home run in 1960 uh, to defeat the Yankees in game seven. Uh, and then I've been studying Buddhism for almost 50 years now. So I have sort of the baseball part of my brain and the Buddhism part of my brain that, that came together strangely in this book. There, there have been books about baseball and philosophy, but sometimes it feels a little strained to make the point. Uh, have you read any of these other books about baseball and philosophy? I've started reading some since I did the book. I intentionally did not read anything about baseball and Buddhism or baseball and Taoism or Hinduism or, or anything because I wanted to sort of have a fresh take. I wanted to do something that I hope would be original. So I didn't want to be influenced by anybody else. You know? Now, one of the things that uh, we, we joked about this in, in the correspondence, there's a, a Steve Martin joke about taking a, uh, if you take a math course in college, you forget about it in a year, but if you take one philosophy course, it screws you up for the rest of your life. Uh, and I'm not gonna say this book has screwed me up, but it has drastically changed uh, my thinking. Uh, you write uh, chapters on different aspects of Buddhism. And the one that struck me most personally is the concept of impermanence. Right. So now when, when a little thing goes wrong at work, I don't make a big deal out of it because I know this is impermanent. Tomorrow it'll be forgotten. Uh, next week, no one will remember. A couple of years, no one will remember I existed. You know, that type of thing. It goes, it's a real rabbit hole. Uh, yeah. do, do you take into consideration <laughs> how this will screw people up? <laughs> Well, I wanted to find a way to bring sort of the basic teachings of Buddhism to an audience of people who love baseball as I do. And so I wanted to use uh, examples from baseball to sort of teach the basic Buddhist truths of suffering and impermanence and no self. And I did it, admittedly, as a Yankees fan, I've gotten some hate mail for that because uh, what do Yankees fans have to complain about? But I wanted to show that even for a Yankees fan, there is suffering, there is impermanence every single season, every single game. And so I didn't want to give up my allegiance to the Yankees to write the book. And so I made that the centerpiece in terms of a lot of the examples. Well, one of the other things that struck me is uh, ego, self, that there is right. no self. Uh, uh -huh. And the question of, I mean, you've been a Yankees fan for a long time. So are the Yankees of 2020 the Yankees of 1960. Uh, talk Absolutely. about that a little bit, how that yeah. changes over time. Yeah, so I, I wrote the book as, as a Buddhist sutra, as if the Buddha himself was teaching uh, this, this text from the, from the mound of the Yankee Stadium. And so, as you know, in every chapter, I have someone from the field or from the stand asking a question. And I have an old Yankees fan rise from the bleachers and ask him, what are the Yankees? Where are the Yankees? Uh, and the Buddha gives the example of, let's say that in a given season, the roster completely changes from opening day until the end of the season. There's not a single player who is on the, on the, on the field in game number one who was on the field in game 162. Is it the same team? Where are the Yankees? And so this was an example of what they call emptiness in Buddhism, a lack of self, a lack of anything permanent that stays from moment to moment. And so I used the, the roster as an example for that. So yeah, it's a big question because uh, when I look back uh, <clears throat> at my old baseball, baseball cards, I remember all the players of my youth very well. And, I, and, and back then, I think I knew almost every player in the major leagues. Uh, it was, of course, fewer teams back then. Today, I mostly just concentrate on the American League East uh, and the Yankees and sort of my, my focus has shifted to stay on that team. But exactly what that means as a fan is, is, a, big, is a big change. 
The other big change, of course, as you know, is you know I talk about the kind of nostalgia of uh, reconstructing a game entirely from a box score in baseball and in, in, in the newspaper. And now I can watch the game, listen to the game, watch the condensed game, you know, read five articles about it the next day, and I do, but it's a different experience of the game. So that's another big change. That's another form of impermanence for the fan. It reminds me of another uh, joke about Seinfeld is that now you're basically rooting for laundry because the players <laughs> change, players change <laughs> so often. Talk about the impact of, you, you talk about nostalgia in that, I mean, I also remember, uh, I could probably visualize the, the starting lineups for the Washington Senators of the mid-1960s, but I can't name a single player on the Arizona Diamondbacks right now. Yeah. Talk about what free agency has done to this it's, it's, you know, it's a big change. Of course, it's very important for the players and it's a huge improvement for, for the life of players, especially the players who are not the big stars. And so in terms of the quality of life for the players, it's, it's, it's definitely a huge improvement. But it's changed what it means, again, to be a fan. Because again, as you say, growing up, I can name the starting lineup for 1960. And those guys were on the team for 10, 12, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the Yankees, as you know, they would just trade somebody to Kansas City going to get rid of them. But pretty much, if you knew Kansas City and the Yankees, you knew the roster. Today, you know, it just changes so much. And so, again, it brings up this question of identity, of self, and of allegiance. And yet we still somehow are rooting for exactly, as you say, the laundry or for the interlocking NY or for the pinstripes, right? Well, one of the things that, that I thought of was uh, relocation. I could take a team like the Montreal Expos, move to Washington. It's the same players, but now it's not the Montreal Expos anymore, even though you have some players who might have been on that team for 10, 12, 15 years. Right. And what do you do about team records, right? And so who, who has the, you know, the most wins for that franchise? Is it Pedro? He was with them, obviously, right? Pedro Martinez started out with, in Montreal. How do you count all those things? And, and numbers, as you know so well, are so hugely important in baseball. We care more about them than in any other sport. How does that translate to the identity of the team? It's another big question. Well, let's talk about other sports for a minute. How You, you mentioned that you, you might be passing uh, through the room and uh, you'll switch to the last couple minutes of a basketball game that you have no interest in other than the fact that it's on and it's the last two minutes. And this is, you know, these are all timed games. And as you note, baseball theoretically is infinite because right. there, there's no clock. Uh, although this year, because of the pandemic, they changed the rules a little bit right. to speed things along. But talk, talk about, I mean, if, if you have impermanence in baseball, don't you have the same thing in all these other sports as well? You do. I mean, so the, so the idea, of course, is that impermanence is a universal truth. And so it's found not only in, in all sports, but in every moment of our life. Uh, but I thought baseball provides specific examples of that, uh, the way that players go into slumps, the uh, pitchers lose their stuff, you know, from one end into the next. Uh, there are all of these moments that happen in a given game that I think provide, because of the slowness of baseball, also provide an opportunity to sort of reflect on those things during the game which is difficult to do in a fast-moving basketball or football game. The point, about watching, me, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. the point about watching the ending was that, that I, I wanted to make the point that uh, change in, 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 in real life is something that we fear. That change in real life, as we've seen in the pandemic, is something that is horrifying to us. And yet in sports, it's something exhilarating. We want to watch that last shot. We want to watch that Hail Mary. Uh, because ultimately we know that the change that results from that game doesn't matter. Ultimately, no one dies, no one gets hurt. And so there's a kind of vicarious enjoyment of change that sports gives us, and baseball in particular does that. And so one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to look at things that really don't matter that much because it's a game, and yet we get invested in those things emotionally. In baseball, we can we can hate the umpire. We can, you know, we want, we want, twin killing, we have all this stealing, all these things, killing, stealing, all these things that are so terrible in life are just part of the game in baseball. They're metaphors and they allow us to sort of think about those things and how insignificant they really are so that when we're outside the stadium, maybe we won't get as angry, we won't get as attached to something because we see on the baseball diamond, it doesn't ultimately matter that much. Now, like, like you, I will pass by a game, I'll, I'll turn on a game and 
I have no vested interest in either side. I'm not a big fan of the other sports, but I find myself rooting for who's ever losing in a close game at the time. Right. Yeah. So as, as you saw in the book, I go through this very strange uh, sort of mental machination that, that I go through if the Yankees are not in the playoffs, because we all in baseball figure out a team to root for. And there's a re there are reasons to do that. And they're completely irrational. And yet we come up with them. And so I think baseball, in a certain sense, uh, does does sort of engender this this idea of allegiance, even <clears throat> for a team that you don't care about if they're not in the playoffs. And you, you write that no game is so filled with suffering as baseball. And right. that, that's true for, for the eight <clears throat> player. Uh, you, you write about a, a, a five-tool player who rises through little league, through youth leagues, through college, into the minors, into the majors. And then at some point, as we all do, they start to decline. But whereas you and I, and uh, in, in our decline, it's not as noticeable to millions and millions of people we're not out there on television as uh, the most beloved players start hearing the, the boos from disappointed fans. Uh, I, I find that you know, very sad about aging athletes. But as you say, ultimately, after reading the book, it seems that none of this matters. Yeah, we, we feel bad for these players, especially because we love them so much. And, and this decline comes, as you know, we, we're all reading all these stats that show that decline starts maybe about age 32, right? And so uh, they have many, many years to live and to think about that and to reflect on that. And so it's, it's almost kind of a curse, I think, to, to lose those skills that have identified you and be so important to you for, from your earliest memory and to lose those at a pretty early part in life. And so that's another particular kind of suffering that baseball players, I think in athletes in general, suffer that uh, those of us who have not played professionally really can't appreciate. Uh, you, you mentioned curse, which makes me think of karma. So everything we have done in a past life, and past life is not necessarily human form, it could take many, many, many forms. Uh, so it made me think when you write about Chuck Knobloch, you know, what must he have done in a formal life to deserve what happened to him at the, the low point of his career? You mean when he couldn't throw to first anymore? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. There are these things, there are the yips, there are pitchers who, you know, can't, can't hit the, the catcher's net. You know, we looked at Gary Sanchez this past season for among Yankees fans. He just, two years ago, they talked about him as the greatest hitter on a team of great hitters. And now, should he be traded? I mean, this has happened so quickly. It's so ephemeral. And the Buddhist point, of course, is that everything is like that. We just don't notice it. Well, ephemeral is, is a, a great word for, for reading through all, all this. Uh, this is not a very large book. It's, it's few pages, and in fact, uh, part of it is uh, repeated. The sutra part is repeated from the uh, the preambles, uh, which, I mean, as, as an expert in Buddhism, uh, what was the most difficult part of writing the book like this? Well, so the, the first part, which is kind of my own baseball autobiography, was pretty easy, it's just, you know, writing down memories. Uh, but then I came to actually having to write the book, and as a, academics in general don't really say what they believe about something, especially if you're a, a scholar of a religion. We're supposed to talk about the history, the doctrine, to analyze this or that, but questions of belief are something that are private. And so I actually found it very hard to find the voice to write didactically, that is to, to profess Buddhist ideas. And finally it came to me, well, I've read hundreds of Buddhist sutras, I know what Buddhist sutras sound like. Let me write a sutra in the voice of the Buddha. And then once that's there, I can write a commentary. I've done that many, many times. So it was, it was a real kind of light bulb moment to think of, let me write this as a sutra and pretend that when Yankee Stadium was being demolished in 2008, they discovered this manuscript buried there. They took it to the New York Public Library with a Sanskrit text called the uh, Dandakandaka text sutra, which means the baseball sutra. And so really to have the idea that the Buddha invented baseball to teach us about suffering. So once I had that kind of model there, the book became very easy to write. But it got me to, it took a long time to think about what's the voice that I should follow here. So the chapters are, we've mentioned permanence, we've mentioned suffering, we've mentioned no self, we've mentioned karma. Tell us about, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Vajrapani? 
Vajrapani, yeah. So Vajrapani is a, a, a famous deity in Buddhism. And uh, the name Vajrapani could really be translated as he who holds a club in his hand. And so I thought, well, this, this must, let's just translate this as battered. And so the idea I came up with is that Vajrapani, this great deity, appears in the form of a great hitter over the course of baseball history in order to teach us various Buddhist truths. And again, despite the fact that I am a Yankees fan, I decided that the person I should talk about is the great embodiment of Vajrapani in our memory is Ted Williams. And so I have him uh, give some teachings uh, about uh, this idea of, of, of living with compassion and wisdom and power. Uh, Vajrapani is of those three qualities of a Buddha, Vajrapani is the embodiment of power. And so I wanted to use Ted Williams as, 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 the, uh, as the incarnation of that. You know? And as you know, Ted Williams, as good as he was, was no five-tool player. Exactly, right? Nor was he, well, nor was he a great, uh, for lack of a better word, humanitarian as, as an athlete. I mean, he was a humanitarian off the field with, with his charitable work. But as, as far as dealing with the fans and the writers, he was <laughs> Yeah. But again, Vajrapani is a wrathful deity. And so that William certainly had that element of wrath. And so that fits, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, you've written many books about Buddhism. Uh, so this is a bit of a departure. It seems like it was fun to do. It was a lot of fun to do. It really was, yeah. It was a, it was a, joy, to, a joy to write, and it was a break for the, kind, from the kinds of things I typically do. And so, yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. And it was, gave me a chance to think a, a lot about baseball and read a lot of old stories, watch old games, and those the things are sources of great pleasure for me. So it, it was fun to write, yeah. Now, uh, the book was released in, uh, I believe, May of this year. So right. obviously you had it written before all this transpired. Exactly right, yeah. Uh, I imagine that you had been looking forward to book tours and guest spots on talk shows. Uh, uh, what happened with that? <laughs> Yeah, no, of course, the, the publicity department for the press did everything they could, but between COVID and the election, it just was not a time for baseball books, especially with the season happening as it did or not happening. So I did a couple of events online, uh, one bookstore in Washington. Uh, my dream of uh, giving a lecture at the Hall of Fame uh, didn't, didn't pan out. And of course, my ultimate dream of throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium also didn't help. Didn't, didn't <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, so all of that was just went out the window as it did for so many authors. So it, was, it certainly was not me as speaking to other people had books coming out uh, in the last, uh, during the spring, it's been hard for everybody. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk a bit about the, the practical side of, of this. Uh, when did you start working on this? Uh, so I had made notes for the introduction uh, over the course to maybe three or four years and not really not knowing what to do with it. Uh, and then it was actually in the summer of, of uh, 2018 that I got the idea of writing it as a sutra. And in the course of, so I wrote the whole thing uh, probably in about uh, two months. It was almost like you read about these mystics and their automatic writing, right? They're sort of possessed by some spirit and it just, it just flows uh, right, in, right onto the keyboard. So the writing itself went pretty quickly and then there's, as you know, the process of getting it together and copy it took, took a while. But yeah, it was, uh, the writing happened in the summer of 2018. And how did you go about finding a publisher? Oh, uh, well, I have a fat, fabulous agent uh, who is a Mets fan. Uh, and despite the fact, despite, despite that, we did along quite well. Uh, and he was able to, he saw some potential in the book and chopped it around as agents do and ended up with St. Martin, which got a great press uh, with many, many fans on the staff there. So it was, it was a lot of fun working with them uh, in the entire editorial process. Can you think, uh, is there any possibility, could there be a sequel to this? Uh, I haven't thought about that. I, I guess there could be. I'd have to think about what that would be. Uh, I've, in, my, uh, in my teaching at the University of Michigan this, uh, this past semester, I had to come up with an entirely new way to teach the course on Buddhism as a podcast. And I ended up putting a lot of, uh, of blues, uh, put music uh, in the lectures uh, just to give the students a break. 
So uh, Buddhism and the blues has been on my mind a lot lately, and I may do something in that direction, but uh, I could come back to baseball. There's obviously a lot more to say, many more stories to tell. And I can almost see this as a documentary isn't the right word, but as an audio visual, I could see this. And I, I, I hope you could find some way to put something like that together. I think that would be very enjoyable to watch. And very educational yeah, as well. Absolutely, we can even do it as an animated thing, right? And have, have the board exactly. here. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, Donald Lopez Jr., it's been a pleasure talking with you. I highly recommend this book, Buddha Takes the Mound: Enlightenment in Nine Innings. I uh, want to wish you good luck with this and uh, promoting it and getting it read. And stay safe. And uh, thank you very much. Best wishes for a happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks for the great conversation. Happy New Year to you.